Uh, Coach, uh, how uh, how's Quadri Allison doing, and uh, Coderell Patterson looking at the running back group there with uh, for you here in the mini camp? Yeah, uh, Q's done a, a nice job. He, he's really so at this point. Again, all we're basing off of is what we've thrown at him, but he's doing a really nice uh, job with the middle part and the protections, and um, very happy with his progress. And then CP, uh, obviously, he's. He'll play multiple spots for us. He did a nice job, you know, at the end of the year last year in Chicago running the football, and he's obviously well documented his history returning kicks, and you know he's got some receiver background, so he's he's another cool versatile piece we have in our program. And uh, with Kyle Pitts, uh, coach, um, what are what would be the keys here? You know, this uh, mini camp, he still got some OTAs left. What are your what's your plan for him the rest of the way off before you all get the break? Yeah, just like with, with all our rookies, D-Led, um, whether it's Kyle, it's Richie, Jalen, Javen Hawkins, same thing. We're just trying to push see what these guys can handle mentally and bring them along so they understand the schemes. And uh, obviously, we've been in a lot of the individual development. So we get into training camp. They're in good shape. they got a baseline understanding of what we're asking them schematically, get over the memorization part, and start focusing on their technique and fundamentals to win the reps. Michael Rothstein. Hey, Arthur, how you doing? Uh, Russell Gage, where do you really envision him, especially with Julio now gone, where do you really envision him fitting into this offense? Well, with all our players, Michael, I, I think that we got to get out of that fixed mindset of here, this is just static 11 and 12. Uh, obviously, Russ has, has worked a lot in the slot, but with all of our skilled players, it's our job as coaches, you know, trying to push the envelope with these guys, see what they can handle. You know, it's easy to sit there and say, hey, he can't do this. You know, he can do this. You know, you're going on history, and Russ has done a nice job in the slot, but we'll move Russ all over the place, and then we got to make a decision as we get closer to the season. All right, we've given him a shot here. He's done well. He's grown his game. We've done this with a lot of players, um, and everybody's on a different timeline. So we envision Russ playing multiple spots. This might be an odd question because you just kind of said it to get out of the static fixed way of 11-12. In basketball, you know, there's kind of the talk of it being more positionless. Do you almost view your skill players as somewhat positionless, or is that is that maybe pushing it too far? Again, Michael, uh, yeah, and, and I'm obviously a big basketball fan, and that's worked for some, some teams, certainly. Uh, you know, positionless players, and then you go other teams, they've got to play their strengths. Uh, you know, that's the one thing, you know, watching those uh, Memphis Grizzlies team, the 2010s, you know, they had who they did and Gasol and Randolph in there. I know the game was going, but, you know, it's there's different ways to play and you got to play the strengths of your players. Uh, certainly the, the, some of the players that we've drafted or brought in a program we think can, can play multiple positions. But if a guy, take a Lee Smith, for example, you know, Lee's not, we're not going to ask Lee to do the same thing we're doing with Kyle. Ask, we're asking Kyle to do. So, but we got to use Lee in the best role he can if he wants to play big boy football inside. And that's why Lee's here. We're, they're not necessarily, they're both called tight ends. But uh, yeah, I'm fascinated by it, but you got to have the right players to do it. Um, if I wanted to be, you know, spread the court and shoot a bunch of threes, I better go get Steph Curry and, and Kevin Durant and uh, Clay Thompson. So if I don't have those, those three guys out there on the perimeter, I got to adapt. Thanks. Jeff Schultz. Arthur, I know that uh, Matt's had that playbook for a long time and has obviously been played in the league for a while. Um, but watching uh, the workout yesterday on the field, I know there's a lot of dialogue between you and two going back and forth. How how sort of common is that and, and how much are you sort of talking to each other so he gets a feel for what you want and you get a feel for what he likes to do? Yeah, it's a, you know, Jeff, uh, it's a good question. It's a relationship building every day play call or quarterback. And that's just my philosophy. There's a lot of people been successful doing a lot of ways, but just personally, it's he and I having dialogue. It's, you know, it's my, my job as a coach to push him to also listen. Um, and, and Matt, he wants to be coached. That's what I love about the guy. He's going into year 14. He wants to be coached. And usually the great players, they, they want to be coached. Uh, I certainly don't think I have all the answers. Matt certainly doesn't think he has all the answers. So it's great dialogue. Sometimes I make a little smart ass comment to him, or sometimes if it's been how you want to push him, or we have an open dialogue depending on what we're he's talking about. So it's fun. It's fun to work with him. And this is kind of a broad question too, but are there things that tend to come quickly and then things that tend to take a while um, before you're 
YouTube uh, coach and uh, play caller and quarterback are really in sync and on the same play or on the same yeah. page. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's whether it was with Marcus or Ryan, you know, there, there's a relationship building. And then until you really get in the games and get a true feel, you know, every, a lot of times people say that they, hey, I'm, I'm this way. And then you get around. I've been a lot of coaches and they lose their mind on game day or a player. He can't, you know, he can't take coaching on game day. So sure. Um, you know, you know, hope as we get into the season, we get a good feel and that trust is, is developed and, you know, I prove that what I say is it, I'll actually come through with it. So uh, it's been fun so far. But, yes, they'll, they'll take some time. Scott Barrett. Hey, Coach, um, I was curious if you could maybe uh, go into some greater um, – detail about how you mentally tax these players you you you've you've used that phrase before is it about you know um information overload or going off script to see how to how they um react how do you mentally tax these guys um you no, know during this portion scott and then again i don't think that uh we're like the nsa over here but there's some things i i, I wouldn't like to openly to say here here's my Coaching philosophy is a very competitive league. Uh, and I do appreciate the question, Scott. I'm just not going to get into it and say, hey, here's what we're doing. I don't think we're doing anything special. I just really don't want to make it easy for the 31 teams in case we have a good idea. I'm not sitting here saying, hey, I'm so I'm so smart. So not that I think I am. I'm just saying, Scott, that, that, I, I will be vague on questions like that. Okay. Um, well, then let me ask, do you feel like the guys are making the type of progress that you would like to see with what – you're asking them to do yes uh these guys are doing a nice job uh, these guys coming in here they're working uh, in our strength and conditioning program not in the field and they're handling what we're throwing at them and that's what it's a constant evaluation uh, in all three phases when when dean or marquise and dave and i we get together we got to see what what we put in what's working what they can handle uh you're always going to have a day or two that feels a little bit like a drag because you you know they reach a point and that's going to naturally happen in training camp too but that's a constant evaluation Allison? I wanted to follow up with something that we were talking about yesterday, uh, especially when it came to uh, like leadership styles. And I wanted mm -hmm. to know what you thought kind of makes a, a great leadership. Is it one that kind of leads by example? Is it one that's really vocal? Because some teams you talk to, they have a lot of players that say, I lead by example, but then they lack with you know guys that being vocal. So what sure. do you think makes the best leader? Well, they're, they're authentic. And, and, uh, you know, that's the one thing is the, the players, I mean, they see, they see and hear everything. They know what's real and what's not. Whether a guy sits there and posts his uh, workouts on social media and, you know, hashtags that he's grinding or whatever he's doing. And then they come in here and then the, the players look at him and are like, no, this guy's not what he presents on social media. So it's got to be authentic. They know what's real and what's not. Same with the coaches. Try to act like somebody you're not, they're just not going to buy it. So, uh, it's really about being yourself and, and proving it. So if, if a guy sits there and has an impact, he says he's a leader by example, and he is an example, and he's you know trying to outwork everybody, they'll get in line. If a guy says that, and then he's the back of the line, not in shape, you know, six mental errors of practice, they tune him out, regardless of what he may or may not post online. And when you break this mandatory mini camp, what is your message to the guys? And do you have rules or things that they they have to follow before you know they show up again for training camp? Well, again, going back, and this has come up fixed the way we've handled this mini camp. We made it mandatory, but it was really more importantly to get the physical to see right it was where every player was at. So we're still in our OTA mode. So the message has been the same as we're trying to, to, to grow and develop every day. And like I said, schematically, we want to be pretty comfortable uh, at the end of next week. And guys are different things are coming up. You know, some guys, they have some family things. we got some players that are graduating, which is which is awesome. And they should be there. You know, guys that are going to walk. So they may not be here for a day. Uh, but the message is to get us ready and be in the best shape. And then we'll assess when we get to training camp. But that's on them because they, they need a break. It's good for them mentally. But physically, they got to be ready to roll come late July. Tanitra? All good. Thank you. Got uh, time for a couple follow-ups. D-Lit? Yeah, Coach, how Dante Fowler look? Was able to look at him a little bit yesterday. <laughs> Wanted to see how you guys are uh, checking out uh, his work here. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it was good to see Dante. Uh, he's in good shape. Uh, you know, physically, he looks, he's done a nice job. Uh, he's been training and that's the trust you guys say. I mean, these are, these are grown men. And, uh, like when they come in and out of here, 
he knows what, what, what we expect, what the expectation is uh, for training camp, but it's uh, Dante's look good so far. Mike? Yeah, you were talking about a break. Do you have anything planned for your, like the six weeks away? Are you, you know, disappearing to an island or going to, you know, going to a cabin or just sitting around the house? Like what, what's the plan for, for Arthur Smith between well, next week and camp? Well, um, I've got a huge family. Michael uh, said, I, I told Mr. Blank when, when he hired me, he, he sold a lot of tickets because my family is huge. I try to get to see him, you know, as probably everybody on here uh, in the last 15 months or so, we haven't gotten to see everybody. And, and so it'll be nice to see a lot of my uh, family at different uh, spots throughout the summer. We're going to move. I wish I had something a little more exciting to move like everybody. When you move, it's a pain. Uh, and I, I, I'll try to chip in. I don't want to get uh, accused of, of, of uh, jumping out of there when my wife's doing all the work. So I'll help with the move. Uh, that's kind of my plans and see some family. I understand the movement thing all too well. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Jeff? Just one follow up to that. Any family up in Memphis buy season tickets? They did. Yeah. Well, they did. Big, big, uh, hopefully we can build a, a fan base in Memphis. But yeah, there's certainly a lot of, a lot of tickets sold from my end in Memphis. Scott? I'm good. Thank you, coach. All right, Scott. Allison, last one if you have one. I'll go for it. I know you don't like to compare players and people and things like that, but throughout your career, who has been like the best leader or mentor in your eyes? Yeah, that's uh, that's always true. It's like, who's your favorite sibling? Uh, you know, who's your favorite kid? Um, you know, probably maybe it's a little nostalgia. I, I put this. One of the better leaders I mentioned yesterday was London Fletcher. Um, you know, even as a as a young coach, just picking. London's brain about, hey, what do you really need? Um, you know, when you're getting up there and present uh, in Washington, you know, get up there, get up a screen and gadget report. And, you know, I'd ask a few questions. You try to learn from everybody around, players and coaches. Uh, London was one early in my career that I thought he was a real leader.